Would you rather wear heels or flats for the rest of your life? Heels. I kind of like, that's my favorite part. I'm Dr. Mara Wozniak, and I'm a U.S. Olympic fencer. I feel like the sport really shaped me to be a confident and very strong woman. When I was 11, my hair was like this. It was wild. I'm showing you how to recreate different celebrity signature looks. Beauty for me is confidence. Just like knowing how you look and being okay with it. In my beauty bag, we have perfume, a little Charlotte Tilbury, a little lipstick. There's the silence, this expectant Hi, silence, right? Am I right? Um, so, Michelle, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Happy Friday. Happy Friday. I wanted to open by asking, I was just on your website, which I know you guys relaunched, um, and I love, 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 love the BTS Kylie Jenner video. Oh, why, thank you. How did that come to, to, to happen? I mean, was it, it's, it was really cool. <laughs> so, for those of you who don't know, so we have Kylie on our newest cover, and she was amazing. I think that the way that she looks has been so well received. Because I think Kylie has sort of like her normal look. She's a girl who loves a lot of makeup. We did her in a little bit more of a stripped down way. We rented this beautiful house in California. And we had dogs running around. So I think the behind the scenes is really great because you see this different side of her. Like obviously we see her 24 seven on Snapchat and everything else. But it's just this really beautiful representation of her that's really fun too. And I like the cover story, too, because it really delved into the fact that we don't know the real Kylie, and she doesn't know the real Kylie, really. Exactly. Well, the thing that always kills me, I was just saying to someone before that Kylie is a very polarizing person, right? I fully accept that. You either love her or you are completely like, I can't, can't take it anymore. Everyone always says, you know, what are these girls famous for? They don't do anything. But I'm like, each of those Kardashian-Jenner girls has like 50 businesses. Yeah. So it's really interesting that like once you actually dig in and spend some time with them, like they're such, they're actually really great, nice, sweet girls who are really hardworking and like they're, they are constantly on. You know, to be um, big on social media and to, to really have the lives that they do on like TV and everything else, it's a lot of work. I know, and to uh, add to your point about people saying, what are they famous for? I have a 12 year old niece who um, is fully into the whole, well, you have a daughter, so you know the, the only time <laughs> that girl has been nice to me in 12 years was when I hooked her up with Kylie Lip Kits. <laughs> so go Kylie Jenner. I got some family respect. How do you choose your cover subjects? I know your first ones were Naomi Campbell. It was a dual cover, Naomi Campbell and Bella Hadid. And I thought that was like really forward thinking of you to put Bella on the cover because that was before she got the Dior campaign. Yep. And when she was still kind of Gigi's sister as opposed to being who she is now. Yep. So um, with cover subjects, I think that, well, just to give you guys a little bit of background too, so I've been at Allure since November, so I'm a relatively new editor there. For me, the vision was and really... you came from Nylon. Exactly, I came from Nylon. Nylon's whole thing is identifying new talent, right? It's sometimes finding that person who is just about to really, really become huge. So I really wanted to bring an element of that to Allure also. The fact that one of my very first issues that I was working on was our March issue, which was our 25th anniversary, right? So how do you celebrate Allure's 25th anniversary? What we wanted to do was to bridge that world of taking the iconic supermodel, Naomi Campbell, and taking the new supermodel of today and tomorrow, and that was Bella. So I think it's constantly having conversations with our own staff, but then also listening to our audience and figuring out who's resonating with them. Like, who are people really, really excited about? And now when you look at that whole Hadid family, they, they are all fascinating. Like, it's not just Gigi, it's Bella, now it's also Anwar. There's definitely this buzz that's building about all of them. Do you go with your gut when you pick a cover subject? Yes, I do. I, um, we also had, in May, we had FKA Twigs as our cover, and I think that she's also someone who, she's not your traditional women's magazine cover star, but I think that there's something about maintaining that relevance 
within the world of culture too, right? We want people who have a really strong beauty story because we're allure, but we also need someone who has a great story to tell and that they're also just really culturally relevant. One thing that I love um, about what you've said, I think you said this to Ad Week or Ad Age, I always, sorry, I can never, one of the ad magazines was that you really want to bring more diversity to Allure. Yes. That's mandatory for you. Which Absolutely. Is, which I think is incredible. I worked at 17 a million years ago, and I remember how difficult it was yep. because there's a certain aesthetic that's expected of fashion and beauty magazines, and diversity, whether in color, shape, size, is not really something that I guess is a mandate for a yeah. lot of people. Well, I think it's a personal mission of mine because I've worked in publishing now for about 20 years, but I think that I think about myself growing up, right? So I have, I'm Chinese, and I have what people call monolid eyes, right? So for me, when I first started putting on makeup, I had no idea what I was doing. Um, my mom was not a big makeup wearer, and that's usually like the other source of like how you would learn to put on makeup. Um, but when I would read magazines or I would read books or something, it completely did not apply to me um, in terms of like how you layer your eyeshadow, how you want to do your eyelashes and everything else. So I just remember growing up and thinking there's so little information for me. Nowadays, the beauty industry has changed so much because now we have YouTube, we have bloggers. You can find seriously any niche that you want to anywhere. The problem is, though, there's not a lot of great information. So I always think that we're in this heyday of interest in the beauty world, right? There's, there's never been stronger interest in makeup and skincare and other things, and that's fantastic. It's just that what's happened, though, is that we've had this explosion of information, but it's not very good. A lot. I mean, not to diss all of it, because some of it is really good. So I think that for me, coming to Allure, um, diversity has become so important, but also giving people really great information about things, too. Like, I think that there's this massive white space between quality and connecting with people. So if you can connect with people and multiple people, we really want to make sure that we're identifying and we're doing things that apply to a wide range of people in our audience. But, you know, connect with people, but also have a high quality. No, it's true because there's so many, I mean, there's a glut of beauty bloggers out there, but then are they really writing the truth or are they just trying to get stuff? I mean, exactly. big well, difference. I think, I think there are really, really fantastic vloggers and bloggers out there. And what's been amazing to see is that, again, like the personal connection that they have with people is so amazing. And I think that from my perspective, coming into Allure as like a 25-year-old brand and figuring out how do we evolve this brand, I really wanted to make it in every sense of the world a more personal experience. Right, I always say in our office that um, for the past 25 years, Allure editors very much have spoken in the royal we, mm -hmm. which is great, and there's real power behind that, the fact that we as a brand believe this. But I also think that there's power in connecting with people on a more individual level, too. Our beauty director, for example, Jenny, is so amazing. Like, I think that we have the best beauty team in the entire industry, like probably the entire world, which I think I'm probably not overstating that. Um, but, you know, to know about Jenny, it's sort of like she is someone who tries hundreds, if not thousands, of beauty products a year. So when you've done that and you know so much about the science behind things, you know about ingredients, what she then chooses to have in her makeup bag or what makes it into her medicine cabinet holds a lot of weight, right? That you, you have access to everything you possibly could have. So I feel like we're doing our audience a disservice if we don't open, open that up a little bit more and really lift the veil and show people, here are the people who are behind creating this brand. Because I think ultimately there is this, um, there's an interest and a curiosity behind what editors do and what they like. And that brings me to you. You share your beauty pics on, on Insta. So how do, how do you decide how much to put out there and what, what to share with readers? Um, I share a lot, <laughs> probably too much sometimes. So I, I've thought about this a lot recently, like the, the evolution of social media, right? And specifically about editors, because I think for a lot of us, I mean, you know, MySpace obviously coming before, I feel like for me, my first, you know, platform that I got really into was Facebook. Then I got really into Twitter. And I think that the platform that probably resonated the most with, with editors and creatives was Instagram. So I was actually a, a somewhat of a late bloomer with Instagram, and I, I don't know, I think it was that thing of like, I was like, I'm not a selfie-taking person, like, I don't really want to do that. And I remember um, 
there was an investor at one of the companies that I used to work for, and he made this offhand comment to someone who I worked with about, oh, Michelle only has like 50 followers on her Instagram. She better like pick it up. And I remember hearing that from someone else, and it made me so mad. And I was like, that's it. I'm going to show him. And then I got really good at Instagram, and I kind of got hooked on it. And I think there was this, um, you know, I think then some people thought that the way that some people were using Instagram was not authentic, right? Because everybody was using filters. They were making everything look so perfect. I still totally love Instagram. But then I think it opened the door for Snapchat. Because then you have sort of the more unfiltered view of things. Because you can't edit Snapchat. I mean, you, you can throw filters on it and everything. But I, as soon as I started working with Snapchat, like doing things on Snapchat, I loved it. So I'm big on Instagram, big on Snapchat. And I, I love to share things about my day. And I think that the things that resonate the most with the audience are anything behind the scenes and also any products. So I feel like, um, especially with Instagram, I was in Europe for Fashion Week. And I showed, this is my travel bag. And these are the beauty products that I took. And that was something that just went, like I had so many comments and people being like, oh, I love that product too. What do you think about this one? And I think it was because it was like, it was my real life. And I was saying, these are the products that I'm using. These are the ones I truly love. And I just think it's really important for editors not to be solely focused on just sharing within their editor's letter or something. Like, my very first job when I first moved to New York was um, at Glamour, back when Ruth Whitney was the editor in chief. And I always remember, you know, as just a magazine editor, the one time that you have to connect with your readers on a personal level is your editor's letter. So imagine that's just once a month. Nowadays, as an editor-in-chief, because you are in charge of your entire brand and its entire image, like I think everyone needs to understand that your relationship with your audience doesn't end as soon as you type that last period in a sentence. It really extends now to 24-7. How active are you on the Allure website? And how, do you, how active do you expect edit your editors to be? Um, I'm re really active on it, and I want to become even more active in it. So um, as you were saying, we actually just relaunched our site a couple days ago, and I really want people to be a voice in there, obviously still somewhat in the royal we, but also to have a personal voice in it. So you'll start to see a lot more from our editors about what their picks are, what their personal stories are, but then also, um, you know, beyond just our staff, there are going to be a lot more stories of other interesting women. So we just launched a new video series called Pretty Powerful, and we have on the site right now, if you go on, um, this Olympic fencer, Dagmara Wozniak, who is amazing. She's like this purple-haired fencer. And we really wanted to show how beauty touches so many different people's lives, right? Like, I have my own personal story, you have your own personal story, and it's not just about mascara and eyeliner. Like, everyone has a story about body image, about how appearance touches their lives. So it was really broadening the concept of what beauty actually means to all of us, too. And do you feel that the editors are willing to really go personal? Definitely. Because they have no choice, Definitely. Right? So, so I mean, you want to succeed, well, that's what they do. I mean, we don't want to, like, strong arm in anyone into, like, writing anything, but um, our executive editor, Danielle, has just launched a new column where she's doing a personal essay on, on different things. And I think that once you actually say to people, we want you to write about something or we want you to do a video about something that really has strong meaning to you, like, you can come up with any number of really amazing, awesome, fun, emotional, creative topics. And now i got to ask you what I think we all want to know. How many products do you get a week? <laughs> I mean, are we talking like boxes, bags, suitcases? Uh, it's a lot. It's definitely a lot. So I, I feel bad for my assistant sometimes because it's just like the bags. It, it kind of comes in waves sometimes, but I will get bags and bags of stuff. So my home, I've had to completely reorganize my bathroom, my closet, everything else to basically have everything be a big beauty closet. My medicine cabinet is insane, and it's something that I'll share on Snapchat pretty frequently about just how I actually fit everything. So I like to be pretty organized with my skincare products especially, but my entire medicine cabinet is like wall to wall. Um, it's a lot of stuff, and we actually just, um, we're putting the finishing touches on our Best of Beauty Awards issue for October, oh, which is the best, like I know everyone best loves Best party that. of the year. <laughs> um, for that issue, we got in 10,000 products to test. So I myself, my entire closet in my office was, was packed to the gills, and we really do, you know, it, it's, it's such a process to go through everything, but we really want to be fair to everyone and really do such a great job of testing that it, it's so, so important that multiple people try things, and it's, it's a really rigorous process. <laughs> 
What are your top five products right now that you're using? Ooh, top I mean, five. given or top ten, if yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Given that it's so hot out and sunscreen and blah 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 blah. Yep, daily sunscreen for sure. Um, feel free to name brands. If yeah, you want. yeah. So I. Like, I, I talk about Olay all the time, but I'm actually really obsessed with it. So I've used for decades Olay. So I use just like the, the white um, sensitive skin one, which has SPF in it, which is amazing. It's drugstore product, really, really great. So I'm that type of person who I'm not a snob about things. I will use anything from like drugstore all the way up. I also am really into the skincare brand. Um, I think it's doctor only, but it's Environ. It's actually made in South Africa. It's really great. They make a really good toner, and also um, they have like a really good retinol cream. Um, what else? Oh my gosh, so many. It's almost too many to mention. So Tarte makes this really great eyeliner that just came out. It's called Tartist. Um, I'm a big cat eye person. So if anyone could just give me the Adele cat eye every single day, I'm a happy camper. So Tardist is like, to me, it's my favorite new eyeliner because it has on one end, there's a gel, um, there's a gel eyeliner and there's another end that's a, like a nice winged eyeliner tip. Um, that's really great. And lipstick fanatic also. So I had a really great makeup artist do my makeup today, but I'm constantly on the lookout for a new lip product. I love NARS for lip products. My absolute favorite red is Rita from them. And I, I feel like I tell everybody about that. Like there are certain products that I'm just like fanatical about that I, I shout from the rooftops. Um, who, in terms of celebrity, who do you think kind of exemplifies beauty today? I think it's so many people. And so I, way back in the day, long, you know, a long time ago in my career, I was an entertainment editor and I worked in celebrity. And I think about now how different the world of celebrity has become and, and even what that term means, right? Because now we have reality stars, we have um, influencers. And I would even say that for us, beauty brands themselves and people who are associated with them are also celebrities. I mean, obviously you have the celebrities like Jessica Alba and Drew Barrymore who have their own beauty brands. I think that it's a really diverse range though of who exemplifies that. I mean, I'm personally like a huge Beyonce fan and I feel like she's someone who can kind of do no wrong and across all cultures, across all ages, like she's just so, so beloved. And I feel like she's also, she, she does take some risks with her beauty look and she likes to change it up. So I feel like if there were one person that I would put that on, it would probably be her, yeah. Do you think that celebrities still have the power to move product? Oh yes, people definitely. Still they look absolutely at them. do. They, I think, celebrities still have the power to move product, but it's also, again, it's gotten broader, right? So it's not just celebrities, but I think it's also when we do our own editors' favorites um, on Allure.com, it does incredibly well because, again, the power of that Allure brand and the fact that we've we've tried so many different products, it really means something. But then influencers, um, you know, it's definitely a much wider audience at this point. And our new site, we actually have this really cool new feature called what we're calling our collections. So it's basically an editorially curated collection of products that we can curate in any number of ways. So on our launch site right now, we have Charlize Theron giving her six favorite products. So it really does, like, I want to know what she uses. Like, she looks amazing. So for, for the average person to say, oh, great, let me, like, click on this thing. She uses this product for her skin. She uses this eye cream. It's still really fascinating, and I think um, for people who have access to anything that they want, mm -hmm. the fact that they love something, it, it holds a lot of weight. And I also was really interested in how you view YouTube, because you've said before that you can't, you can't no one can compete with YouTube. It's, it's, it's futile. So do you guys go to YouTube to find bloggers, or how do you work with, with it? Um, yeah, so, I mean, as you were saying, I have been asked many times over the past couple of months, how do you plan on competing with YouTube? I don't want to compete with YouTube, unless we're going to build a worldwide platform and have people submit videos to us. There's no one who can actually compete with YouTube. What I want to do, though, is really smartly partner with them. I see interesting um, YouTubers all the time who don't have huge audiences, but they have so much potential, and maybe what they're saying is really great information. So we're actually launching um, our own incubator for social talent, and some of those will be um, vloggers, some will be bloggers, some will be Instagram stars, Snapchatters, and I think that that's a really interesting thing for us because not every person on YouTube is right for the Allure brand, right? Like I think that, 
again, you know, talking about that, that white space. Like, I feel like um, there are a lot of people on YouTube who they're really great. It's the girl in their bedroom with the webcam. On the upper end of the spectrum on YouTube, you have the brands who all said, hey, this YouTube thing is getting really big. We should probably be in here. What they've done, though, is that on the upper end of the spectrum is that they're producing videos that are overly produced, right? So they, they think that to maintain their image and everything else, it needs to be this glossy, perfect view of things. What happens, though, is that you end up producing something that looks like a TV commercial. Nobody wants that, right? On YouTube, if you see a commercial, you want to hit, you know, like, after your five seconds, <laughs> skip ad. And so if you've just produced something that looks like a long-form TV commercial, it's, it's not going to do well. So I think for me, I look at YouTube as a really big opportunity for us to be able to connect in the same way that the girl in her bedroom with the webcam can, but to be the slightly elevated and really trustworthy expert version of those things. And last question, where's print going? Oh, print is still thriving. And I will say, I think that, um, you know, going back to what I was saying about we are in beauty's heyday, right? Like everybody is fascinated with beauty. I think that for Allure, there, the interest in print is still thriving and growing. And it's something that it has been carried along, I think, with this growing interest in beauty. It's such a different experience though. I mean, I'm so excited about the new um, website but it's such a different experience than sitting down with your magazine. And it's not that one replaces the other, they can actually complement each other. To me, my mission is that um, if you're an Allure fan, we touch you wherever you are, right? If you're that type of person who you're getting 80% of your content now through Snapchat, we should be reaching you through there. Then maybe we pull you in, you say, I really love Allure. I'm gonna check out their Instagram. I'm gonna check out their website. You know what? I'm going to also look at the magazine. It's such a different experience, and you're in such a different mindset when you want to consume all of those different things. And now for our audience, please. Hi. Hi, Miss Lee. Um, so it's true. I love, like, the personal behind the scenes. It's one of the biggest, like, connections that I have when I look at any brand. Um, and I wanted to know two questions. What celebrity or individual haven't you interviewed yet? And what's been the hardest project that you've worked on since you've been with Allure? Oh, so who, who have we not interviewed yet? Well, going back to my girl Beyonce, I guess. <laughs> really hasn't Beyonce, done, well, yes, yeah, so Beyonce hasn't has, she yet. has been on the cover of Allure, but I think that she's sort of like, she's my holy grail dream cover girl. Um, and then hardest thing that we've worked on so far, I would say the hardest thing has been, it, it probably is the website. And not in that it wasn't fun, but it was just a big challenge. So when I came on board, I, from day one, knew that we needed an overhaul of the website, right? Our site had been built about five years ago, which in, and we always joke in our office, in internet years might have well has been 20 years ago. So it was built on really old technology, and like what was so fun for me was that I'm kind of a unique editor in that I started in magazines, like most of my career is in fashion magazines, but I actually also have a background in responsive web design and UX, right? So for me coming in, I didn't have a steep learning curve. I was able to come in, talk to the designers, developers about like, here's, come on guys, let's really brainstorm and come up with something really innovative. What was hard though was that we came at it from a place of, we didn't want to just reskin the site and like slap on new fonts and change a couple things around. We wanted to do a complete reimagining. So we had so many meetings and brainstorms about how do we actually use this to change the entire world of beauty. So I feel like it was a lot of work, but it was so, so worth it. And like, I mean, it's only a couple days old now that people have been seeing it, but we've gotten such an amazing response so far. Next question, please. Hello. I also have two questions. I wanted to know, how do you piece together your look day to day? Because I really love your dress and your <laughs> shoes. <laughs> you look really beautiful today. And I also wanted to know what essential clothing should every woman have in their closet? Yeah. Um, so my look, <laughs> thank you very much. It's very flattering. I was wearing flip-flops this morning because it was raining. Um, I feel like through the, like, as I've gotten older with clothing, I have taken more risks. I think that um, back in the day when I first started working in New York, I was head to toe black all the time. Like, that was just my look. I never wore color. I always said, I hate pink. I'm not going to wear pink. And then I just really loosened that up. And I also, I don't know, I'm big into, maybe I don't look like so comfortable today with these shoes, but like 
I'm big into comfort, too. Like, it's so much about, like, if I put something on, I need to be comfortable. Because I feel like how you look on the outside definitely, you know, you end up reflecting that, how you're feeling on, on, on the outside also. So um, I'm big into comfort. I'm big into shoes. I'm a big shoe girl. Like, I feel like I've bought shoes before that I will completely just create outfits around my shoes. So in terms of, like, what I'll spend on, I'll spend on a really great pair of shoes. I bought, a couple, like, last season, I bought this pair of Gucci shoes that were, like, my seasonal splurge. So I would say, like, for any woman, splurge on your shoes, and then you can build your outfits around that. I'm also, in the same way as I am with beauty, I am not... I'm not a snob about what I buy. I'll shop at Forever 21 and buy a $20 outfit. And, you know, I feel like if you dress well around those things, you can completely pull those off, whether it's in the office or just going out or, or anything. And last question, please. Hi. Hi. So what would you say the biggest difference is for someone looking to get into writing and print today versus when you originally got into it? Oh, it's so different. <laughs> so I mean, you know this. It's so different. It's, um, Do you remember the 80 layers of editors in oh the beginning? Oh, my gosh. So and, many. and, like, how many... Oh, my God. When I was, at like, at seven... I mean, it was, like, 50 people would edit an article, and by the time it came back to you, you were like, what is this? <laughs> exactly. The, I mean, the process itself is different, but it's, like, the training is different, too. I think when I was starting out, um, and you were in journalism school, do you remember the slush pile? Yeah. So <laughs> there was this thing. I feel like I'm, like, talking about, like, caveman days. So the way that you would become a writer, let's say, is that you would snail mail your proposal, and there was this whole process by which you had to send this, and then the poor interns and assistants would get what they would call the slush pile, and they had to read all these different proposals and everything. Like, this is pre-email, right? But there's this pre-internet and pre-email. So everything has changed so much that to be an editor, and then especially if you want to ascend to be an editor-in-chief, you have to really become, you have to be a polymath, right? You have to know so many different things. It's not just about becoming an English major or a journalism major. You really now have to be all around creative. Like I think that you need to know social media, you need to know digital, you need to know business. That's my biggest advice that I always say to people um, who say, how do I become an editor in chief? No business, because there's really not a track that gets you to that point. A lot of times as an editor, you're, you're kind of thrust into it, right? You're thrust into a management role and you're thrust into a business role. But actually, if you had more of a business training beforehand, no matter what you want to do, it's going to really be the thing that takes you far. And make sure that you spell check everything. Yeah. <laughs> no, literally, my first ever journalism assignment um, was writing about the governor of Maryland at the time. And it was William Donald Schaefer, and he spelled his name with... Schaefer was spelled, I can't remember. Anyway, it was, it was a weird spelling, and I didn't check it, and I got an F in the entire class. Oh, my gosh. So and, and don't, that still holds true today. Exactly, and, and understand what trustworthy sources are and not trustworthy, yeah. because I think that there are a lot of people who, like, more junior people who we see come on, and they'll just Google an answer, and, like, with fact-checking, right? Mm -hmm. We all know that if you Google something, there are some trustworthy sources and some not-so-trustworthy. Yeah. <laughs> so. Thank you so much, and Allure.com. Thank you, guys. Yeah.